Hello and welcome to Cheetah TV. My name is Brian Badger from the Cheetah Conservation Fund. In this series of videos, we're giving you a bit of an insight into some of the projects and the initiatives that the Cheetah Conservation Fund are involved with both in Namibia and in fact around the world. And today we're giving you a bit of a glimpse at our genetics lab. Now the genetics lab in Namibia was set up in 2008 and it's a kind of a, a unique one of a kind operation out in Africa. Now it relies on lots of different elements to gather information and data. Elements like our scat detecting dogs. Now these are dogs that are trained to go out into the bush with their handler and identify specifically cheetah scat or cheetah poop, also known as black gold. Because it's totally uninvasive, no, you don't hardly ever see a cheetah uh, in the wild, gathering that cheetah scat enables, enables us to identify the cheetah's diet and also it enables us to extract DNA to find out more about the distribution of the cheetahs, the relationships between the different ones and uh, lots and lots of different information that's gathered. Don't forget, if you do like the video, please give us a like before you leave and subscribe to our channel. Uh, in the meantime, what I've done is I've spoken to Dr. Anne Schmidt-Kunzel, who's the Assistant Director of Animal Health and Research for the Cheetah Conservation Fund, and I'm sure she can tell us a whole lot more than what I can. So let's go over and join Anne. So hello, Anne, and thanks for joining us. Hi, Brian. <laughs> Introduce yourself to everybody. So I'm Anne schmidt -Kunzel. I am Assistant Director for Animal Health and Research at CCF and I've been with CCF for since 2008. 2008, so it's, it's, that's some time and I'm sure you've seen many changes over your time at CCF. Yes, absolutely. It's grown immensely in that time. <laughs> so what I thought we'd, uh, we'd concentrate on, if you don't mind, is the is the genetic side uh, uh, of CCF because I know that you're and um, the animal health as well so it's the veterinary uh, the veterinary side that, that that you're obviously involved with but um, as far as the the uh, the genetics lab and the genetic research that's that's been going on can you tell us how that started at CCF? Yes, it started a long time ago with a dream that um, Dr. Laurie Marker had to have a laboratory on site so that we can do our research um, the way we need it and answer the questions that we're most interested in. And then I joined CCF to actually get it started in 2008. And we started off very small in the basement of an existing building with one room where we organized everything as best as we could and got it started and proved that it was possible with little projects and with, with what we were able to do. And then we were quite lucky to get an upgrade on the instrument that was able to uh, let us do four times more work. And also we were able to get a better laboratory space um, that was tied to the fire, which was quite devastating for CCF, the building burning down. Um, but then when they rebuilt it, we moved the laboratory there. And that laboratory is really state of the art and um, you know, big spaces, every room nice and separated and clean and really designed for the laboratory purpose. And so we've been working with that um, since 2015, I believe, and um, have been very, very happy with it. And we're about to start our third phase where even that instrument started to get a bit old and we're upgrading that as well as a lot of the other equipment um, so that we're really able to rely on it not breaking down anymore because, as you know, we work a lot with everything donated, which is also often not the newest. We have a lot of very, very equipment, and uh, it is about time that we get reliable equipment to do our work. So we're excited about that prospect. So when, when, the, when the project, I'll call it a project, but uh, it was the culmination of that dream, um, what was the initial questions that that was 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 kind of um, driving the, the that dream? What 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 was the first things that were the that needed to be known? We just want to look at the genetics of the cheetah in Namibia, and for that we keep collecting samples with our great scat detection dog team, our ecology team, 
our clinic team to get as many samples as possible on human wildlife conflict team. Let's see what the structure of the cheetah is in Namibia. We know that it's not very um, defined, that the cheetah is it's called panmictic, so that it's really moving across Namibia relatively well. Um, but we want to have more information for specific areas where the cheetahs haven't been for a long time and we want to figure out where they're from. So believe it or not, we don't have the answer for that question yet. Um, but it's actually not due to the genetics on that. It's also because those areas that have few cheetahs are still very difficult to sample. So we still don't have enough samples to get that, but we're getting closer every year, and especially the scat dog team is doing so well at the moment that I think we really um, can plan on having that done in the next couple of years. Yeah, because we're not just looking at, at, at Namibia, although Namibia is a focus. I mean, you, you're looking at the whole of the range countries and um, uh, many people don't realize how much land, how much expanse that is. You know, when you talk about the size of Africa, you know, that, that's let alone the, the, the Asiatic cheetahs and, and stuff. So um, the, the task is huge. And I, and I would imagine that um, the, with, as with most research, you know, you end up with more questions than answers sometimes, and that kind of drives you to the next step. So I'm sure that the, the new genetics lab has helped in some ways answer those questions that have been generated, but also generated more as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a lot more questions that we're looking into, including diseases in cheetahs. So we are looking at infectious disease, um, which is Babesia, which is a blood parasite. We've been looking at that for a while. Um, so with our, our center in, in, um, in Somaliland, uh, what type of things are you, are you looking at? Just give us an example of the stuff that we're looking at there. So um, there's a lot of work that we're doing in Somaliland, as you know, with setting up the center and the health as well. So I'm also involved in the health side, but, set, but I think since you said that we should focus on genetics more for this talk, I'm gonna talk to you more about that aspect um, that I love talking about. And so um, we got quite a few samples from Somaliland because unfortunately we have a lot of rescue cats that are living there and so that have been cared for there. And so those samples, we assume there's assumptions as to where they come from. Um, but when you get at confiscations, of course, you cannot know for sure where the animal was taken from the wild and how it made its way into Somaliland. And so that's a big question that needs to be answered. And so we have looked at um, the genetic maker to figure out where they come from. And so there's different levels that you can do that. The first one is very broad and we've, um, that's what we've just finished, with, which is to look at the subspecies or the region, roughly the region that they come from, um, to confirm that they are originating from the area um, that we suspect. And so we've been able to do that. And then the next step, which we are building to and just actually got some funding, I guess just the result today, just like half an hour before the call, um, that we'll be able to also process them a bit further and to try and understand the structure within so that we can maybe, instead of just saying, okay, that cheetah came from that region, that we can say, and within that region, it is more likely, likely to have come from the northern part. Um, or the southern part, and so that we can pinpoint the origin of those um, cheetahs a bit better and figure out where they got caught in the wild. Because of the cheetahs' lack of diversity, it's more tricky. So, you know, you might be aware of the um, ivory trade in the elephants, where they can tell you, oh, that elephant comes from that national park. Um, the cheetahs being more similar to each other, we don't get such a high resolution. But we can more or less get the, you know, we can narrow it down to an area which is already really, really important for all the efforts of the fight of the legal trade, that they know where they need to increase their vigilance. It's a really important project. So when, when you're talking about analysing, um, you know, like you were saying, the, the, the first step is, is the region, region and, I, and I'm kind of plummeting into my very little knowledge of, uh, of, of genetics, but, you know, you, you, Am I right in thinking that it's the um, you go to like one step deeper and you've got like the natural mutations that, that happen over generations? So is it like micro satellite, that, that type of thing? Is, is that how you, you, you kind of hone, you focus in a little bit more? Well, yes, 
Absolutely. So maybe you should give the presentation because you understand all of it anyhow. <laughs> so I would like the, the, you know, lead the conversation, I should say. So um, yeah, so absolutely. So the first step is to look at what's not constant. And so I'm, it's called barcoding or mini barcoding. And so we look at um, a sequence that is going to match the subspecies. And so that's the first step. The next step, as you say, is to look at what's called microsatellites or short-term repeats, which is used in paternity in, in humans or in forensics as well. And so those are, they have variation in the cheetah, and yes, that's rotations, and yes, they're recent. And so that's a little bit of a paradox for, for the people who don't understand genetics as opposed to you, and who say, so how come the cheetah has variation in those microsatellites? The cheetah is supposed to not have any variation. And that is because those microsatellites mutate really fast. So for them, 10,000 years is quite a lot of time. And they've been able to create new mutation. It's completely useless for the animal. Um, none of the markers, that, the microsatellites that we're working with has any sign of selection, and they're also not expected to have any function. And so it doesn't help the animal, but it's diversity that helps us. And so for the geneticists, it's really important because we can differentiate individuals, we can do relatedness, we can do um, pedigrees, and you know, use it for structure in a population thanks to those microsatellites that have enough diversity for us to work with because they had 10,000 years to create that new diversity with mutations because they mutate really fast. But um, so it's important for that point, but it does have pretty much nothing to do with the big question of survival of the cheetah in terms of diversity because the rest of the genome, the one that is coding for genes, that is going to give a cheetah an advantage because one of the enzymes works better or something is just different, um, those do not mutate fast. And so those are still, are still lacking diversity. So it's just like getting a be better quality fingerprint. It doesn't change anything, but it makes it the, the ID, the identity yeah. a, lot, uh, a lot easier. Yeah, a good, a good example. I'll, I'll, I'll use that one. Uh -huh. That's a better quality fingerprint, absolutely. <laughs> so. I'll send you the bill. <laughs> um, I mean, when people look at the genetics, and and in if you if you don't understand genetics, like like most people do, to any any you know in depth, um, there's a lot of misconceptions about the genetic state of the cheetah. You know, for instance. You know, I've heard people say, you know, the problem with a cheetah is the lack of genetic diversity, you know, where, you know, where we know that that's not the problem. You know, there's lots of other problems. Right. So the, the cheetah does have no genetic diversity and we all agree with that. But that is, as you say, not the problem because the cheetah has had that low genetic diversity for thousands of years, around 10,000 years is what is estimated. And that's a good sign in a way. It means that the cheetah has been able to live with that low genetic diversity for a long time. So it's not very diverse, but it's pretty good quality. Um, so likely due to selection, um, if you want to get into the more technical si uh, side of things, but so they've been able to live with that but what it does mean is that we know they've been able to live with that in the world from yesterday. But the big question is, are they going to be able to live with that in the world from tomorrow? And that is something that we cannot predict and where if the world doesn't change, they'll be able to live in the world like that. But um, of course, because they have less vari variability in their genome, that makes that they're less able to adapt. So it does add yet another um, risk factor to their survival for the future. But the most important is to keep the numbers high so that we can at least have the diversity today. And that's where all our conservation efforts come into play to help provide, keep the environment intact and reduce human wildlife conflict and um, all the work that we do in politics as well. And, and I know that we're looking or, or we're, you know, when when we've got such a, a brilliant facility at, uh, in Namibia, I know that uh, over time that there have been collaborations that we, we've helped other projects as well that are in a similar plight, but, but not, not exactly the same. Um, can you give us an example of one of those? Yes, absolutely. We've actually almost from the beginning on started a collaboration with Abigail Gary from Ongava. 
who have a, a rhino population there, both black and white rhinos that are living free, they're managed, but living free, and that have been investigating their rhinos to look at the diversity in the population, but also the, the structures. So to see who, who is the father, because they have to make sure that they don't get too much inbreeding. And so they have studied um, their genetic, the, the genetics of their rhino population in our laboratory. And so it does regularly and we help them with the processing and the analyses. That's great because we, we, we don't only, you know, sh um, share information or, or, or collaborate with, you know, you mentioned the Smithsonian and, and, and all, all the other organizations, um, uh, scientific organizations. We're also going the other way because the, the, there's probably not an easy alternative um, for, for projects like you say, well, like the rhinos to, to, to actually have benefits from. Right, absolutely. It's um, not that easy for the, this type of advanced research to be performed, um, especially given that well, Namibia is a small country in terms of population size, so the availability of laboratories is very limited. We're the only conservation genetics laboratory that is in situ in a conservation organization. And um, so therefore, People who do research in Namibia don't have a lot of places where they can do that genetic work other than sending samples abroad, which has two issues. One of them you have to deal with permitting, CITES permits, for instance, for the endangered species um, that are trade restricted, but also you have to realize that if you send the samples abroad, that means that the samples are going to be processed abroad and they're going to be processed probably in the US or in Europe. And that means that the people who are lucky in the sense that they're able to do that project are going to be Americans and Europeans and not Namibians, even though the, the wildlife lives in Namibia. And so our laboratory actually has a lot of interns and students coming through from the University of Namibia that we train and that to do the project with us on their own species. So that's also quite exciting. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the about the interns and um, the, the the fact that you know that we put such an importance on training not only Namibians but Africans, you know, because their their opportunities to to study and and learn in a, in like like you say a state of the art state of the art facility. I would imagine that the the uh, the, the opportunities are so limited for for those students. So we take it really seriously to train, to give opportunities for training and we're an official placement for the University of Namibia as well as the Namibian University for Science and Technology. And so they send us their students as part of their rotation and they get credits. And then we also do long-term internships of six months for students who have finished their undergraduate degree so that they really get an in-depth training on conservation genetics and also learn about all the other aspects of CCF's work. And those we screen and we scan to find out, you know, who the best ones are. And we then um, try and keep those so that they stay at CCF and that they continue to grow with us. And we also accept students from other countries. We've had um, visiting students and sisters from Kenya as well, from uh, Zambia and from Angola. So we, in South Africa, so we do absolutely also have other interests in other countries but we favor Namibians when possible yeah and i'm sure that the fact just the fact that you're there and the lab is there um kind of generates more of an interest to the universities as well because they know that it, it is um it is that you know that possibility whereas the, the you know that they probably haven't got the um the resources and the equipment and, and and the knowledge, to be perfectly honest, to teach that. So you, you've enabled that that learning stream, you know, within uh, the Namibian University and, and the college that you mentioned. Would you agree with that? Sure. I mean, they have, in theory, you know, they have also some a lot of knowledge in at the University of Namibia, but they have invited myself as well as Dr. Fabiano Isikil, who was in our laboratory, who did his PhD with us at um, CCF, who is now at University of Namibia. They've invited us to give guest lectures as well on the topic of conservation genetics, because that's, of course, a very specialized field that they don't cover as much. 
yeah so that that's uh that's enlightening as it is just just to have that you know to be part of the country rather than just a ju just a project so you know it really is the future uh, of of conservation so when we're talking about um the the, the studies and the and the genetic um information that we can gather uh, you mentioned the the scat dogs i know we're going to be talking to tim a little bit later on about the scat dogs but how 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 useful has that project been? Well, it's incredibly needed, <laughs> I should put it that way. It's a very, very difficult project to start because, as you know, cheetahs have very, very low densities and are almost impossible to spot. Um, and so finding scat samples is easier because every cheetah drops a scat sample or two a day. And so there's more of them in the environment, especially in Namibia, where they stay in the environment for weeks. Um, and weeks. We love talking about scat, as you know. Yes. Um, but so, <laughs> so there's a lot more cheetah poop out there than there are cheetahs out there. But even those are not easy to find. It's small samples that you don't see if they're hidden in the bush and you have to cover huge areas to come across them. So for us to just go out and find them as humans, I mean, it's not really that easy. And so especially in areas where there aren't very many. And so the our scat dog team has just progressed every year more and more and more and they have for the last year or two actually started to really go out systematically and cover more and more areas and bring more and more samples back. Still not back at school because obviously cheetahs are rare and there's a reason why that work is needed and difficult. But every sample is so valuable to us that it's really exciting to get to get more and more samples in. And it's pretty much totally non-invasive as well. So, you know, that, and, and that's got its, its benefits, you know, from, from, from day one, you know, that, so it's that alternative um, rather than having to have hands on on a cheetah, which you say with the, with the, um, the densities being so low, that would be almost impossible. Well, difficult because it's hard to catch the animal, but also a risk for the animal. And because when you catch an animal, there's, the animal could injure itself in the capture process and um, it might, you know, even we are very well, um, we have a very good clinic team, so we don't get incidents during the workups. We haven't lost cheetahs during the workups and so not, no healthy cheetah, obviously. And so that is something um, in a way it's, it's not really, I mean, we're not really worried about losing an animal, but the risk is there and taking the risk just to get a sample is something that I cannot justify. And so if you have to work the animal up for other reasons, of course, you know, we take a sample and we're really happy to work with them because they're a lot easier to work with than scat samples, but to just go out and catch the animal so that we can find out what its genetic fingerprint is, um, is something we definitely don't want to do. And so yes, Finding the scat samples with the scat dogs is 100 times well. So, for instance, we're just in the process of adding a project where we work with the human wildlife conflict team, where we look at the bite marks if there is a wildlife or livestock that has been attacked by a predator, where we can also use the saliva on the bite marks to figure out who that predator was. And so that, of course, leads to increased communication and increased collaboration and yeah, I mean, we are, we're one team or maybe I should say one family. I mean, we just work and live together and think about, I mean, it's our life, I think. I mean, my personal opinion is 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 that Namibia is a, a very forward thinking country um, on a lot of aspects. I mean, that you know, like like any any country, you know, it's got its problems, and, and and there's no denying that. But I feel that what what Namibia is very good at is looking beyond its borders and learning by other people's mistakes. And I, and I think that some of those decisions that were made you know, maybe using that as an example, would be looking at other countries and how that can drastically go wrong. Yes, absolutely. And their, their own past with the, you know, cheetahs exodus to the zoos and then the, the current time in other countries, absolutely. And I mean, Namibia is an amazing example for conservation. Look at its wildlife, look at um, the fact that they're actually an integrated system where you have humans, livestock and wildlife sharing the same area. Of course there's human wildlife conflict, but they still have their predators, they still have their game. 
maybe not as much as 100 years ago, should certainly, but they have a lot more than we have in Europe and then we have in the US and we actually still have wild spaces. They're not all big reserves that are fenced in. Um, so yeah, Namibia is an amazing country for conservation and for wildlife. And long may it continue. And uh, and I know that CCF has been uh, very instrumental in, in some of the um, decision making and the, the, the forward planning of Namibia. Um, so uh, just from, you know, in the last 30 years, we know that, that CCF is 30 years old this year. And, um, and so is Namibia. So, you know, we've kind of developed along the same path. And I'm sure things have, have, have overlapped and, and Namibia have benefited from, from CCF in the, in the broader sense of conservation. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think I'd be proud to be part of both. Yeah. Well, Anne, it's been great talking to you and thank you for sparing the time. I know how busy you are. And uh, all our best to, to everybody, to, to yourself and, and, uh, and the whole team at CCF. And hopefully we'll speak to you again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. If you want to learn more about that project or any of the projects that CCF are involved with, both in Namibia and around the world, and also to make a donation or to sponsor a livestock guardian dog or a resident cheetah, please visit our website at cheetah.org. Now, if you like the video, please leave us a like and subscribe to our channel. And you can also set the reminder for further episodes on Cheetah TV. Thanks very much for joining us and I'll see you again next time.